Camp Creek this morning. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of our worship service, whether you're 
here in person, watching online, or actually going to be watching a recording of this. We just thank you for being a part of our worship family this morning. If you take out your bulletins, those of you that are here, let's just look at some of the things that are going on in the life of the church. College boxes are going to be assembled tomorrow at 10 a.m., so if you have anything that you'd like to get in them, again, needs to be here by then. Mom's group meets on Thursday from 9 to 11 here at the church. Let's continue to be in prayer about that. Um, Ladies' Aid Christmas dinner will be Sunday, December 11th. That's actually going and will also be our Christmas Sunday. Uh, we'll also be taking up uh, an offering for the St. Labrie Mission on that particular Sunday. So just be prepared with that. And you'll see some information in the bulletin there about um, the fact that Ladies' Aid is not providing ham for that Sunday, so meat dishes would be appreciated. There's a decorated box in the back there. You can put hats, mittens, and winter wear items. And those will be taken taken to the Plymouth Neighborhood Center and can be um, given to them for their uh, distribution during the winter months. Uh, Ladies Aid is updating the church cleaning schedule. So if you have any information you need to get to Jane, um, please do so by the 1st of December. And just a note as we look forward to Um, The 25th and the 1st, which are on Sundays this year, that we will be having uh, one service, one worship service at 10 o'clock with no Sunday school on those two Sundays. So you can prepare yourself for that. Anyone else have anything today in the way of an announcement that they would like to share with the church? Please. Jack. I want to thank everybody for what they've done. I went over and took them yesterday, and I'm just going to get over there today. Uh, the lady said they didn't have many toys, and I think I boxed up 11 boxes of toys that our church has brought. So think about the smile on those little kids' faces when they, they take a toy, and they were really nice toys. You guys, <laughs> I told Molly, I said, this is a church that loves kids. The toys you took out are toys that I would like to <laughs> So uh, we really appreciate everything. And uh, I think Jason has got a, found another trailer. And so they might have three, three loads going down there. This, uh, so it's really, I really thank all of you for what you've done. And this back here will get over there. So thank you. And if you didn't hear that, I think they're up to the third trailer now being taken to Kentucky. Um, I'm going to finish up today and head down there this week is my understanding. Anyone else have anything in the way of an announcement this morning? Okay, seeing none, we do have memory minute today. Hannah, are you ready? I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4. Thank you, Hannah. I appreciate that very much. As we enter our prayer time, does anyone have anything as in the way of a prayer request or praise that they would like to share with us this morning? Brian. If you didn't hear that, Brian's brother David was able to spend uh, Thanksgiving with them and eat, um, and again, doing well. So we praise the Lord for, for that. Anyone else this morning have anything in the way of sharing that they'd like to do? Okay, seeing none, let's, uh, let's spend some time in prayer this morning. Father, we do... Praise you. Thank you for being our God. A God of greatness, of might, of holiness and mercy. You are creator, redeemer, and sustainer of life. And we just thank you so much for being a God that loved us enough to give us a way in our sinful state to spend eternity with you. Thank you, Father, for that. And this past week as we've celebrated Thanksgiving in our country, 
Um, and we have so many things to be thankful for. And uh, just pray that we would not forget those things and we continue to thank you for the many blessings you put in our lives in so many ways. Father, we just uh, pray for those in Kentucky this morning uh, who've lost everything and we just thank you for the, the ability for us here in this community to reach out to them and uh, Father, you, uh, we know that the third trailer is being filled now to be able to take stuff down there. And uh, we just pray that those people would be blessed by the uh, gifts that they're receiving and the um, things that they can, can use in, in so many ways. And those that have been willing to give and send there, we ask that a blessing would be bestowed upon them also. Father, this morning we pray for uh, those in, in leadership in our country, and Father, we know that you are in control, and we just pray for those leaders as they make decisions, and we would pray that they be made in accordance with your word and accordance with your way. Uh, Father, yet um, so many times when it seems like things are going out of control, help us to remember that you are in control, and you are the ultimate power and authority. Father, we thank you today for being a great and a mighty God. We pray for Duane as he teaches us this morning. Might we receive a blessing from that? Might you continue to lay on his heart the words you've given him this week as he's prepared, just uh, that they would come um, freely and quickly, and ask that you would uh, be able to help us have a, a good morning of being together as a church body. Father, we thank you that you love us. In your name we pray. All right, I am not usually a talk before I sing person, but I got the challenge this morning and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me off the hook, so apparently I'm gonna talk a little bit. Um, so Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays, and um, there are Thanksgivings where it's obvious and it's just so easy to give thanks and to find all of the ways that God has blessed us, and there are so many, always. Um, and then there are seasons where it's harder. and. One of the reasons that I love worship and this song that uh, Charlotte and I are about to sing is because no matter if you're having a Thanksgiving this year that is the blessings are just boundless and you can't even find an end to your list, or if you're struggling to find the one, um, our assurance and our faith and our joy comes from God. And he does not go away. And his, his steadfast love for us cannot be shaken. And this song just goes on and on about how he is our strength and our, our source of joy and all of these things that we are looking for. And so I pray that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, but even if you're sitting here trying to figure out how to transition from a Thanksgiving that was hard into a Christmas season that might look a little hard too, this song is just as wonderful no matter which spot you're in. Is that better? Oh. I heard your testimony. Well, that's good, because I don't know if I can do it again. <laughs>
Children that are involved in children's church, and those of you also are dismissed at this time. Dwayne, thank you for coming and being a part of our worship. In all honesty, I feel like we could right now just close. We're not going to, but <clears throat> I don't want to move any further until I ask you, do you know that blessed assurance, guys? You cannot walk out of these doors today and think that you're going to go through the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that God has placed you in without knowing the blessed assurance that has given you hope, has given you a life, has given you salvation, and for it to matter to anything. You, you, you know that, right? To walk out these doors and not live for the one who has sacrificed his life for you is worthless in vain. And if you don't know him, I am telling you, this is a day for you. You can know him. It's easy. It's simple. Paul tells the Philippian jailer these words. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is all that man said to that jailer. Trust in Christ. And if that's not you today, please seek one of us out. If it's not you today at any given time, you are allowed to interrupt me and say, Wayne, we need to talk. Jack will take over my notes and you and I will step right outside and talk. <laughs> but on a serious note, if you do not know our Savior, which we talk about, pray to, sing about, worship and praise here today, you need to seek us out. We need to tell you all about him. Okay? Deal? Amen. Okay, here we go. Here's the truth of the matter. I'm going to click a button again. Maybe I'm going to turn it on. <laughs> Maybe I'm clicking the wrong button. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay, here we go. Red, green. Oh, I got a green light. There you go. There you I didn't do it. <laughs> that fantastic young man right back over here that's being trained. He is the man today. All right. <clears throat> so some of you are probably thinking, hey, Dwayne, you haven't prayed for Pastor yet. We are going to. Please do not fret. We are going to definitely do that. But in leading up to where we were just talking about and what we were singing and what we were worshiping, you know what? It is a point of once for us to die. Bottom line. After that's the judgment. There is nothing you and I can do. We cannot be as healthy as you want to be or whatever. I mean... There is going to be a point in time, you live long enough, you are going to die. I live long enough, I am going to die. Or, my preference is going to be, the Lord's done, and he says, it's time to bring me home. And that trumpet shall sound, and he shall call us up to be his, and meet him in the air. That's the day I'm looking for, not that I'm afraid of dying, I might be afraid of the needles that might be involved in dying in a doctor's or a hospital or something like that. But the point is, I think Peter is pulling us to think about right now, is for the rest of our time. What do we do for the rest of our time to make a lasting, a lasting, a purpose life that God's calls me part of? What is it that we can do in order to make a difference? for whatever time that we have left upon this earth. And I believe here Peter is going to show us four types of attitudes that we as believers can develop to live the rest of our time to all that God desires it to be. So if you would, take your Bibles out, 1 Peter chapter 4. We are cruising right along through this book now. And we're going to read the first 11 verses together. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life or evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. 
For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dispensation, and they heap abuse on you, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. And if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides in all, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Four attitudes we're going to be looking at to help us develop to be what God desires us to be for the rest of our time. Number one, militant attitude towards sin, verses one through three. That's you, sir. Wait, we got this. You are on the mark. Is it Colton? Cole. 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 Okay, I'll remember that. Cole. Militant attitude towards sin. Picture this. A soldier is getting ready for war. war. He dresses. He puts on his equipment. He picks us up picks up his weapon, and he arms himself for battle. That's the picture we're looking at. It's the same kind of picture that Paul is talking about in the book of Ephesians when it says, put on the full armor of God. Remember, he is imprisoned at that time, and a visual reminder that he has is his guard who puts on his full armor. Please notice, it is the full armor. It's not just sections and pieces of it or what's comfortable and not comfortable, but it's the full armor. So you'll see a lot of military kind of pictures throughout, all throughout scripture, really. Uh, And Peter does the same thing. So the picture of a soldier getting ready for war, he dresses, he puts on his equipment, he picks up his weapon, and he arms himself for battle. What is his weapon of choice? It's our attitudes. Our attitudes are weapons. Weak and wrong attitudes will lead to defeat us. Weak or wrong attitudes lead to defeat. Even the attitudes of, eh, I don't care. I don't care. This is one thing that I have learned about you. You give. When there is a need, you give. And it doesn't matter what it is. I didn't see all the toys, but if Jack was excited about that toys, you give. What a testimony for you guys. You give. You have a a good attitude when it comes to meeting the needs of another community. A believer living in sin is a terrible weapon in the hands of Satan. So we're going to go from attitude. What about the attitude of us believers that would just be like, eh, whatever. I know I'm saved. And they live like the world the rest of the day. You know that is a powerful weapon to Satan, for Satan to hold up to? A powerful weapon that you could have is a believer who has that, eh, wrong attitude, I don't care attitude, sin is sin, in the lives of Satan. It's a huge, huge weapon. It's a huge tool. So Peter gives us several thoughts in order to show, or maybe a better word is to convince us to oppose sin. We don't want to be any value to Satan whatsoever, okay? We don't want our actions, our attitudes to be of any hold that Satan could use to tear down the church. So here are some some thoughts here. Ready? So first one, remember what sin did to Jesus. Verse number one goes right into it. Remember what sin did, did to Jesus. Jesus had to suffer because of our sin. He had to put to be, he had to put He had to be put to death on a cross. Why? Because of our sin. 
He came to this earth in order to deal with and to conquer sin and the penalty of that sin. Therefore, our goal should be that we would want to cease from sin. If I know that sin put my Savior on that cross, why would I want to dabble in sin? Do you understand that salvation is only possible because of what Christ did upon that cross? We know that, right? We say it with our mouth. We believe it with our minds. We believe it with our We say that. Do you understand that if it was only for the sin of Dwayne, he still would have went for the cross? No, it wasn't. It was for the sin of all eternity that he bore upon that cross. But even if it was just for for Dwayne, he would have had to have done the exact same thing that he did and bear it and go upon that cross. So remember what Jesus, what sin did to him. Nailed him to that cross. The whole reason why he had to come to this earth in a celebration that we're getting ready to hit is Christmas is because he was going to go from manger to cross. The reality is we will not reach this perfection goal until death or until that time that God calls us, calls us home. But this should not keep us from striving or pursuing this goal of ceasing from sin. Christ in our lives is key to having victory over sin. Remember we said this last week, we are not fighting for victory, we are fighting from victory because the price has been paid. It is done once and for all. He is seated at the right hand of the God. We identify with Christ in his suffering and death and resurrection. We have victory over sin. The old life is gone. We walk in newness. We just covered that. Therefore, Remember what sin did to Christ and cease from it is one. The next one is this one. Enjoy the will of God. Enjoy it. The contrast is between the desires of man and the will of God. Doing the will of God is so much better than falling back into the old way or the old man. By doing the will of God, we are investing in what? We are investing the rest of our time. We are investing in what God has given us and what's left in our lives in something that is lasting and satisfying. By doing what God has called us to do for however much more time that we have on this earth, we are investing in what is right. Do the will of God. Enjoy it. If we give in to the desires of man, we will waste the rest of our time. So if we are doing it, we are investing in, if we do not, if we give in to that, that sinful ways or the ways of man, we've wasted what time we have left here on earth before God calls us home. We've wasted it. And at that time, when you stand before Christ, you will definitely regret it. We will have to give an account for these moments that we have. The will of God is not a burden, but instead, it is enjoyment. The will is from the heart of God, therefore it is an expression of the love of God. Now understand this, we may not always understand it. <laughs> Sometimes I do not understand the things that God has called us to do or to be or things to say or areas to go. I don't understand it, but I can trust it. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean we cannot trust it. Why? Because it's God. Because it's God. That's why. Trust it. We do not live on explanations, but promises. We live on promises. And ladies and gentlemen, guess what? There is a promise 
someday we will be with him forever and ever and ever. Trust him. So remember what sin did to Jesus. Enjoy the will of God. And thirdly, remember who you were before Christ. Use this one with caution. There are times when looking back at past life, Satan would love to use those memories to discourage us. So when you look back at what you were before Christ, rejoice you're not there as you're looking back. Some of you have been saved for so long, you were never involved in anything major. You were never in sin. You weren't some drug addict on a street. You weren't some alcoholic looking for the next bottle. You weren't looking in sin. You weren't reveling in that muck and the mire, as the psalmist would say. Some of you were saved at a very young age. Let's do this. How many of you were saved as a teenager or older? Okay. Raise them high. Okay. We, we got a seat. There you go. How many of you were saved under the age of 10? Praise God. Because there are things that some of us in older years have had to endure and go through because of sin. That almighty God in his sovereignty has kept you from. Doesn't mean it's any, any easier. Absolutely not. But sometimes remembering what you were before Christ should be an encouragement that Christ came to you so soon. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. So use caution. But God has urged Israel to remember that they have once been slaves. Paul remembered that he was a persecutor of the believers. And this encouraged him to do more for Christ. Think about it. When Paul had to think back, he is the one who condoned the stoning of Stephen. He held the coats to that man. Who in the midst of that stoning looked up and said, look, do you see what I see? I see heavens are open and the son of man is standing at the right hand of the father. Paul was the guy who held their coats to let them kill him. And he uses that to encourage them all the more to do more for Christ. Sometimes we forget that bondage, what that bondage of sin had upon us. Oftentimes, it's too easy to remember the passing, the passing pleasures of that sin. Don't just remember the pleasures. Remember the bondage that that sin had. We may not have been guilty of such grotesque sins that we read in this list. But the truth is, we were sinners. And our sin is the reason why Christ needed to be crucified. This list of sins, debauchery, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. You know what? If that list simply said a little white lie, Christ still would have had to have died. It's not the degree of sin of how we put degrees of sin. Sin is sin. I just never part. <laughs> All right, number two. Mr. Cole, you ready? Second attitude, a patient attitude towards the lost. A patient, patient attitude towards the lost. We must be patient with those who do not know Christ. Even if we do not agree with their lifestyles or participate in their sin, we must be patient with them. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. The idea of loving the sinner but hating the sin. Being patient with the sinner even though I don't agree with what they are doing and what they are standing for. Be patient with those that are lost. First motivation. My God was patient with me. I shouldn't use that in past tense. My God is patient with me. Those that do not know Christ are blind to spiritual truth and they are dead to spiritual enjoyment. Our contact with the lost is important. 
We are the ones to bear the truth, to live out the truth in front of them. You've heard it said before, you and I need to be the sermon that is lived out in front of the lost that presents a gospel. Refer back to that Philippian jailer. All he knew, Paul and Silas was in jail. All he knew, they had been beaten severely, thrown in the innermost parts, and chained to the ground. That's all he knew. And in the midst of that time, this jailer knew, he heard, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the night, or whatever praise song they would have sung. There was something different. And that jailer wanted it. So when he called for lights, Paul and Silas comes down. The jailer, in essence, said, sir, what do you have that causes that? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. That is our responsibility in living life, living the truth in front of the lost. Be patient towards the lost. You may be judged by the unsaved. Don't argue with it. Pray for them. This passage says, some of those friends that you may have had in the midst of those will look at you and now say, oh, you are the holier than thou now, aren't you? Oh, but you used to. You ladies, goody, goody, two shoes. patient. Pray for them. The final judge is God. We may sacrifice our lives in the midst of persecution. God will honor and reward. Fear him, not men. Do not fear what man can do to you when the spirit that lives within you is more powerful do you understand that the spirit that lives within you is the same spirit that God used to raise Jesus from the dead? That's power. That's power. Third one. Mr. Cole, here we go. An expectant attitude towards Christ. Christians in the early church expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. The fact that he did not return does not nullify his promise. We must live in expectancy. He is returning. We will see the Lord someday and we will stand before him. How we live and how we serve today will determine how we are judged and rewarded on that day. There is coming a day. He is coming again. Do you believe that? Amen. You can read 10,000 years worth of history. They've been saying the exact same thing, but it might be tomorrow and it might not. One thing's for certain, we know the promises that we can trust in. He is returning. So in this letter, Peter gives us like a, a Ten Commandments to help in keeping balance as far as the Lord's return. Of what should we be doing as we are expecting his return? Here they are, one big list. B sober minded keep your mind steady and clear watch under prayer verse 7 if your prayer life is confused it's because your mind is too so be sober minded watch unto prayer verse 8 have a fervent love deeply love a sincerity of love it covers a multitude of sins. In fact, these next two kind of attitudes run together. Christian love is forgiving. Peter quoted from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. Love does not condone sin. If we love somebody, we will be grieved to see him or her sin and hurt himself or others. Rather, love covers sin and a love motivates us to hide the sin from others and not spread it abroad. Some of you just perked up. Oh, wait a minute. Where there is hatred, there is malice and malice causes a person to want to tear down a reputation of his enemy. 
This leads to gossip and slander. Love covers a multitude of sin. Did Dwayne just say that we need to love a sinner and cover up his sin? Yes and no. Yes and no. Here's what it means. When someone sins, it is our job to love that individual and to confront them, to pray for them, to come alongside of them of what's going on in that sin. Do you agree? It is not my place to take their sin and broaden it so that everybody else can know to destroy a reputation, to destroy a life, or to destroy whatever the case may be. That's what he's talking about. The love that we are to have that covers a multitude of sin is to confront the sinner, to love the sinner in such a way that that sinner is not being destroyed because of rumors, gossip, malice, or hatred. That's what he's talking about. Love deeply, sincerely, even in a church setting. Now, I know it happens everywhere else, but not here. Prayer request should not be a way to vent somebody's sins to the public and turn into gossip. That's what Peter is saying when it says love fervently as it covers a multitude of sins. It is not that the individual sins free and clear. It's that we are protecting a person, an individual, someone created in the likeness of our creator with love. Does that make sense? So have fervent love use hospitality verse 9 in the original language this is a compound word simply means this love strangers it is easy for us to be hospitable to one another so if it's easiest for us to do that why would Peter really bring it up in this list because the word actually means to love strangers love the unlovable even without the expecting of getting love back Love those that are not part of your community. It doesn't matter who they are, their people status, their job status, their financial institutions. Love strangers. Use hospitality. Love outside of just your community. I think that's one thing that's really, really cool about seeing these trailer loads go down to Kentucky. Outside of you guys and what you brought, I didn't know there was a major flood that destroyed so much. Use hospitality. Minister your spiritual gifts, verse 10 and 11. Use your spiritual gifts to edify others. God's never gifted you to bring yourself up, but to edify others. Speak as if speaking the words of God. Serve in the strength that God provides. Think it not strange. Verse number 12. Oftentimes we can say, well, this shouldn't happen to me. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. I should be exempt from these trials. I should be exempt from this tribulation. No, Peter teaches the opposite. Expect trials. So in the attitude of expecting the return of Christ... Don't think it's strange that you're going to go through trials. Expect it. Rejoice, verse 13. Rejoice when the hard times come. Be glad. Praise God. Why? Because you are blessed. And I cannot help but think of, of an old missionary in captivity, Darlene Dibler Rose, who says, when an interviewer has asked her, you know, why did you go through this? And her response would be, why not? Why would I not go through this for my Do not be ashamed, verses 15 and 16. You should never hang your head because of the God in which you serve. Do not be ashamed. 16 to 18, glorify God. 
Glorify him until he returns. Find opportunities. Look forward to it. Glorify him. Verse 19, commit yourself to God. Add those 10 to our list as we are expecting Christ's return. And then fourthly, a fervent attitude towards the saints. Verses 8 through 11. Fervent picture as an athlete strains to reach the goal. When you see a runner start the marathon, he or she looks totally different than at the end of that marathon. The excitement, boisterous, bring it on, fire that gun, let us go. To the end is, <laughs> for me, I'm crawling, <laughs> asking for oxygen. Where's my water bottle and a stretcher? It's that process, that straining to reach, to complete towards the same. You know what inflicts probably the most pain in any believer? Is when another believer attacks. It's probably the most hurtful thing. I think there's a reason why Peter encourages us have a fervent attitude to work towards the saints. Church institutions oftentimes crumble from the inside out. And it is a very, very painful process when a believer hurts another. Christian love is something that we have to work at. Just like the way an athlete works on his skills, we need to treat others the way that God has treated us. Even when it comes to the opportunities of praying for your pastor and his family, Work at it. Strive for it. Encourage. Encourage in order to make the best of what time you may have left. Encourage the saints. Do me a favor. I want to pray saints and it's pastor that has been called with his family to Camp Creek Church you see it's not just a thing we do in services it is a desired passion that we have because God has put together believers let's pray Father God I thank you I thank you for who you are, the words that you have. But God, as we think about the saints, would you be with Camp Creek Church and everybody within the room listening online? We'll film to it later, we're out and about traveling, even the ones that go to Florida. But Father, would you encourage them to love one another? to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, just as you have loved them, would you cause them to come alongside and to encourage, to uplift each other, to pray for, to enjoy one another. And Father, specifically for Pastor Roger and the family and Stacy and the kids and 
Lord, everything that's going on and encompasses the prayer requests that have come across as far as our patience and decisions and, and the cultivating of, of ground and, and just of heart, Lord, would you work mightily in some pretty amazing ways for our brother and his family. As always, Father, we look forward to what it is that you are going to do in the midst of some of these hard times. In your name we do pray. Amen. My last phrase before you guys, you can go ahead and come on up, come on, come on. As they prepare to lead us in song, how long is the rest of your time? Only God knows. Do not waste it. Invest it by doing the will of God. Let's sing together. Would you stand with us as we close? When I think of Thanksgiving, come on up. This is the song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Join us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly going to join me in today's benediction. Who knows Philippians chapter 4 verse 4? You do, you just don't know you do. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Say it with me. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Lord always. That was not very rejoiceful. <laughs> I'm not sure what basketball game you were just watching, but it wasn't the one I like to watch. <laughs> I'll say it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again. Rejoice. You are dismissed.